Welcome back, my students. Um, we are in Algebra 2, Lesson 37, and we get to use all that we have learned so far to do something a little fun, and that's to calculate some chemical compounds. Like, for instance, we are told that, and we know that, the chemical compound for water is H2O, and then that it's two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Um, we are also told in the text, because I didn't know this off the top of my head, but hydrogen is has the atomic gram weight, or the gram atomic weight, of one gram. And then oxygen has the atomic gram weight of 16 grams. So that tells us that H2O has two hydrogens, so this is going to be 2 grams of hydrogen and 16 gram of oxygen within one atom. So one molecule is a combination of two atoms of hydrogen and one oxygen. So one molecule of H2O, one molecule of water, is equal to 2 times 1 gram because of the 2 plus 16 grams of oxygen, so that's equal to 18 grams. That is what one molecule of water weighs, is 18 grams. So, and that's called the gram molecular weight. Um, we can extrapolate <coughs> or infer then that um, this is not an exponent. This is a subscripted variable or it's written as a subscripted variable. And it's actually just a factor. And what you're going to do is instead of multiplying this times itself two times, you're going to multiply this times the weight of this. So there's two of these. So this is addition. It's not um, multiplying against itself. So we can easily just take the weight and sub it in and say two times, just like we did here, two times one gram. So it'd be one gram plus one gram. Remember an exponent is gonna be multiplication, so that would be H times H or one times one. But with the subscripted number, it's addition, which means we can quickly add by multiplying this number times whatever the value is here. So 2 times 1 is 2. 2 plus 16 is 18. All right, so that was, you know, that was interesting. What can we use this for? How do we um, put this together for something? Well, think about proportions. Whenever we have a compound, and we're given a total weight, we can use what we know about the formula to come up with a proportion uh, based on the atomic weight of each part of the, of the total molecule. So for instance, in example 37.1, we're told that we have 3,600 grams of water, right? And the question is, how much of that is oxygen and how much of that is hydrogen? So we can use our numbers here to give us a proportion of that. So we know we have 18 grams total, right? So in hydrogen, hydrogen equals 2 eighteenths of the molecular gram or the molecule of water and oxygen is going to equal 16 eighteenths of the total molecule so we can tell how much is oxygen and how much is hydrogen through the use of proportions by figuring out the compound here so all we have to do to find the oxygen is to set this proportion equal to the total, which is 3,600, and cross multiply, just like we normally would for any other proportion problem. 
So when we do that, we get that 16 times 3600 equals that number. And then we're going to divide by 18. Divided by 18 equals 3200. So 16 times 3600 equals 3200. So that is how much oxygen we have. We have 3200. Now hydrogen, it'd be pretty easy to just subtract 32 from 36. So we know we have 400, but we're going to go ahead and do this just to see. So hydrogen is 2 over 18 equals x over 3600. We're just going to double check our figures. So 2 times 3600 equals 18x. Pull up our calculator. And 2 times 3600 divided by 18 is 400. So there we go. We got the same thing. So you can see how we can use proportions in chemistry and how we can um, apply them. So let's see if we have another problem we do. So we're told the chemical formula for ammonia. Let me clear this page. The chemical formula for I can spell ammonia. Yeah, there's two M's, but I made something that doesn't look like an M or an M. Ammonia equals NH3. NH3, right? And that tells us that each ammonia molecule contains one nitrogen and three hydrogen atoms. And we have 510 grams of ammonia. All right. How much does the nitrogen weigh? So we're looking for how much nitrogen. So they tell us here, they write it like this in parentheses down here, that the H weighs one gram and the N weighs 14. All right, so we can derive from that. First we have to find the total weight of the molecule. So uh, we have 14 for the nitrogen plus we have three hydrogen. So three times the hydrogen. So 14 plus 3 is going to be 17. So the nitrogen is going to be 14 over 17. 14 of the total weight is going to be, um, 14 of the 17 total weight is going to be nitrogen. So now we just put that equal to our total grams. 14 over 17 equals we don't know how much is nitrogen, but we know we have 510 total grams. So now we pull up our calculator and we do our cross multiplication. Um, 14, let's write it out first, times 510 equals 17 times x. Now we can do the calculation, 14 times 510 equals 7140 divided by 17 equals 420 equals the amount of nitrogen 420 grams is how much nitrogen is in 510 grams of ammonia. So that can be kind of interesting and fun to do. So let me give you another one. I'm going to let you do it on your own. These are pretty straightforward. Um, this one says that we have ammonium chloride. 
And y'all, these are actual uh, compounds that you would come across in history, or in history, in chemistry, not history. Um, ammonium chloride is equal to NH4 Cl, and this is a four. So this, this is ammonium chloride. And we are told that there are 1,060 grams of ammonium chloride total. And then we are told this that we have nitrogen, which is 14, hydrogen, which is 1, and chloride, which is 35. And what we want to know is how much or how many grams of chlorine which is Cl. All right, so that's the problem. So I am going to um, let you pause the video and work it out for yourself and see if you can give me the right answer. So go ahead and pause and then press play and then we'll see what we get. All right, and we're back. So how many grams of chlorine did you determine were in 1,060 grams of ammonium chloride? If you got 700 grams of chlorine in ammonium chloride in the quantity of 1,060, then you are correct. So here's how we found that. First, we just determined the total weight of the compound on a molecular level. And that was 14 plus 4 times 1 plus 35. The 14 was the nitrogen. 4 times 1 was the 4 atoms of hydrogen. And then we had 1 gram of chlorine, which was 35. And that added together to be 53. So we only wanted the chlorine. So we took the chlorine amount, which was 35, and put that over the total of 53. And then we set that equal to the total in the solution, which was 1,060. And we put an X where the amount of chlorine would be, because we didn't know what that was just yet. So then we cross multiplied, and then we divided. And we divided this multiplication here, or this product here, we were able to get 700 as our grams of chlorine. All right, and that is pretty uh, straightforward, I feel, in using our proportions. Um, if you have any questions about that, please let me know. But I think that you guys are going to get that pretty easy. It's almost kind of fun to see how it breaks down and, and what we can find out about each compound. But this is something that you would end up using in chemistry. Um, so or you, could, you could even apply this if you wanted to baking and recipes. It's kind of the same thing. But anyway, let's move on to parallelograms. So let's clear the page. We know that a parallelogram is a quadrilateral that has two pairs of parallel sides, right? So a parallelogram is something like this. Let me make this a little bit more parallel. There we go. So that would be a parallelogram for all intents and purposes. And they have four special properties the pairs of parallel sides have equal lengths and they are congruent. The angles opposite each other have equal measures. This is equal to this and this is equal to this. The sum of any two ad adjacent angles is 180. So it means this one plus this one 
is 180. So it's like two straight angles, right? Or two uh, supplementary angles. And these two would be two supplementary angles. These two would be two supplementary angles. And these two would be two supplementary angles. And that the diagonals bisect each other equally. So when you draw a line here to here or from here to here, you create two congruent triangles. All right, so let me in my pen and let me make some little notations here, put some um, information on this par parallelogram. I'm going to start at this corner and draw a line all the way to this corner. All right, so now I have two equal triangles and I have angle one and angle two and angle two and angle one. The angles marked two have equal measures because they are alternate interior angles formed by the long parallel sides and the diagonal. The angles marked one have equal measures because they're the angles formed by the short parallel sides and the diagonal. Two angles in each triangle are equal so angles A and C must be equal, and the triangles are similar here and here. These two are equal, and the angles are similar by the AAA theorem. The scale factor is 1 because the diagonal is the side opposite angles A and C. Thus, they are congruent triangles by AAAS, which we haven't put a whole lot of effort into because we have not been doing um, geometry and most of us did not take geometry last year, but that's okay. Um, when we write the statement of congruency, we are careful to list corresponding vertices in the same order. If we don't write the ones that correspond, then they are not congruent. Even if they're the same triangle, if we don't write it in the same order, it's wrong, okay? So you can see by looking at this that this is the short side right here and this is the long side. So we have to write it in the order uh, of however we write the first one. So if I were to write triangle DAB, right, short side, long side, I would have to say it's congruent to BCD which would be short side, then long side. If I don't write it in that order, it's not a congruent triangle. All right, so we, that, that helps us to see when we write it that way, I can see just by looking at the congruency statement that DA, side DA is congruent to side AB. I'm sorry, <laughs> I was looking at this and thinking this was an A because I did not write my triangle very neatly. Okay, that's better. So it would be side BC, right? The first two are gonna be congruent. And then, that, then I can tell just by looking at this that AB is gonna be congruent to CD simply because the positioning within the reference within the name of the triangle. That also tells me I can look at this and I can see that side, let's see, DB is going to be congruent to side BD, that they're the same side. Does that make sense? Because you have DB connecting each other here and BD connecting each other here. So you have that one line where they are exactly the same. All right. This proves that pairs of opposite sides in a parallelogram have equal lengths. From the congruent triangles, we also see that angle A has the same measure as angle C and we could draw the other diagonal and use the same procedure to prove that the other pair of angles in the parallelogram have equal measures. And this proves that the angles opposite each other in a parallelogram 
have equal measures. All right. Any quadrilateral can be divided into two triangles. We've discussed that already. And um, we know that each triangle has a degree measure of 180. So thus, a parallelogram has an interior measure of 360 because that's 2 times 180. All right, what else do I have to say about these wonderful parallelograms? Not much, that's about it. So take your notes on this if you need to, if you haven't already, and we're gonna work a couple of problems. So let me clear the page, and I'm gonna draw another little parallelogram We're going to pretend it's a parallelogram. <laughs> it's close. It's really close. All right, give me a moment to draw this figure. All right, so here's problem 37.4. Parallelogram ABCD. Uh, well, ABCD is a parallelogram, and the measure of angle BAD is 65 degrees. So this entire thing here is 65 degrees. So we need to find the measure of ADC and the measure of DCB. And then we need to find X and we need to find Y. All right. So let's look at what we have. So first of all, if this is 65 and this is its opposite congruent angle, then the measure of DCB is going to be 65 degrees without doing any math. Now, because these two are supplementary angles, that tells us that angle ADC is going to be 180 minus 65. So 180 minus 65 is 115. So 115 degrees. That's pretty easy. We got that pretty quick. Now we need to find the measure of x plus 2, or we need to find the measure of x and the measure of y. So we know that this diagonal is going to be equal to this diagonal. So we can set these equal to one another and then solve, right? So let's do that. So let's say, um, well, technically, we could say that this is the short side. So this is going to have to be equal to this short side. So these two are equal to one another. And these two are going to be equal to one another because they're bisected diagonals. So we could say x plus 2 is equal to 7. And y plus 7 is equal to 4 because they're bisected diagonals. So this is going to be subtracting 2 from each side. x is going to equal 5. Subtracting 7 from each side. Um, that's going to be y is equal to negative 3. All right. So that's our answers. We put 5 here and negative 3 here. So we have one more like that, 37.5, only we don't have any diagonals on this one. Uh, let me go ahead, we could do it right down here pretty easily. Let me see if I could draw you a parallelogram.
Right, this is a little bit off right there. There we go. That's better. All right, let me get my pen and let me put in the notations that we need. A, B, C, and D. And then we have 10X plus 50 degrees. And then we have, this one is 5X plus 10. And this is an X. And then this one is Y plus 10. Sorry, I was listening for that noise. I couldn't tell what it was. All right, so we are going to solve for X and Y. So we need to find X is equal to what? And Y is equal to what? So we know that because they are opposite, that these are equal. And because these are uh, adjacent, that they are supplementary, which means that these two are going to be equal to 180. So we could find X first by doing this. 10X plus 50 plus 5X plus 10. And that's going to equal 180. So these combine to be 60. So that's 15X equals, let's take 60 from here, that's 120. Right? So divide both sides by 15 and that's going to be 120 divided by 15 is 8x equals 8. All right, so that gives us the opportunity to find C because all we need to do is put x back in here. So 10x plus 50, that's going to be 80 plus 50 equals 130, right? So y plus 10 should equal 130. So we can say y plus 10 equals 130. So y has to equal 120. And look at that. And both of those are correct. All right, so that's all we have for lesson 37. I'll see you in lesson 38.